Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. How's it going? It is rocked, and there's that music, eh? Little chair dancing. Oh, we have any weather yeah. reports coming in? Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently it's hot in Arizona. Well, yeah. We'll just kidding. <laughs> Nothing fun about that weather report. Nothing unusual, maybe. Except the oh. extremeness, maybe, of the heat. Yeah, yeah. 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 Extreme, well, shmeem. Good, good news hot. here in Ottawa and Eastern Ontario. I don't think we have any tornado watches today, so that's a plus. That's always a nice way to wake up. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Indeed. Lots of folks in the chat. Good morning to everybody joining us, or good afternoon if it's afternoon for you. Good evening if it's also an evening for you. Um, Boy, yeah, it should uh, be evening. It's happy hour over in the UK. If anybody, uh, light bulb yeah. Joe, how you doing? Joe Cook here in the, in the house. Good to see you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Anybody else from that side of the pond? Always good to have you folks joining us. Thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, Chris gang. Was hanging out with us today. Right on. Gang, we have Mike Simmons back. Uh, Mike, we know you've been with us before a few times, but it's been a little while. So, and there may be folks in the chat, uh, in, in, in our group of folks here today who haven't met you yet. So give us your, uh, your superhero backstory. My superhero backstory. I'm still working on my superhero backstory. In fact, I don't think I've found my alter ego yet. Like <laughs> at some point it will come out. And somebody asked me this question the other day and I said, I, I think if I, if I could be anything, I'd be the combination of the Hulk, Spider-Man, and Batman, which I know now I'm crossing universes and all of that other kind of stuff. But I think we can do that these days because everybody is talking about the multiverse and the multiverse operates differently in all of these verses. So I'm, uh, I'm an operations guy from way, way back when. I am a, a customer success guy before they called it customer success when I worked for the company that coined e-learning, or at least they said they did, SmartForce. If anybody remembers SmartForce, there you mm. go. Long, I've been in this space for a while. We were acquired by Skillsoft, still the behemoth in the area. And then I worked at O'Reilly Media. Um, in between those kind of stints, I moved into uh, sales roles as an account executive, then was fortunate enough to move into various leadership roles. Left my W-2 back in... January of 2016. So just crossed seven and seven years and change now and uh, launched a practice where it's historically I've helped people build revenue teams and we're actually in the process of shifting. The new business name is now Catalyst Acts. And I'm going to add a link for anybody who wants to take a look at uh, what we're doing from a website perspective. But that is me in a nutshell. I try to play golf as often as physically possible. And I am getting better uh, every, uh, well, not every day. I take like three steps backward, one step forward, five steps forward, six steps backward. It's like a dance. Yeah. Isn't that so just thanks for having me on. This is super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's that? What's the saying? Uh, what, was it Mark Twain? Golf is a, a good walk ruined. <laughs> it is a good walk spoiled 100 percent. it is a good walk spoiled and i love it but you can't argue with being out there so yeah very cool. yeah for sure yeah so we were uh you and i mike have uh have talked about this uh organization enablement stuff for a long time in our 
our many conversations about the world of work and how corporate training plays into it and L and D and all that kind of stuff. So I thought it was about time we open up this conversation to the masses and, um, and see what people think about it, which is why we decided on the topic for today. So maybe you can enlighten us with a little bit of background on the idea. So this, this is a favorite topic of mine. I think we're always evolving um, relative to the type of work, what we call the work. Some new marketing person comes up and says, this is what we're going to call this thing, whether it's e-learning or micro-learning or I don't, are we adaptive learning still? Like, I, I don't know what kind of learning we're at in the, in the world today, but there's always some new thing that comes up. And I hope that one day people look back and say, I remember back in 2018 at a little conference out in Arizona where I saw some revenue guy get in front of a group and talk about organization enablement. And people were throwing things at me saying we were not salespeople. And that wasn't the point. So here's the point on organization enablement. We all have people inside our organizations who are looking to do better, be better, feel better relative to the impact they're having inside the organization, relative to the teams that they're participating on, relative to the impact that they have with their customers. Those could be internal customers, external customers. Way, way back, a function was created in revenue teams called sales enablement to start doing this thing. And I thought, wow, you know what we're going to do? We're going to see L&D make a change, a shift, to, and think about ourselves as organization enablers. Now, if you're as old as me, and I'm going to turn 49 here in just a couple of weeks, but it, you hear the word enablement and you think, oh, that's not good. You don't want to be an enabler. Like back when I was a kid, you didn't want to enable gambling or drinking or bad behavior or whatever. Enablement is good. We want to enable people to do the things they want to do better and faster, reduce barriers, remove obstacles, create process and systems, design with intention, all of the things that you're all doing when you're thinking about enabling people from a learning perspective. So this, I think, is the next iteration of what learning and development will look like in the future. And I will die on that hill. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perfect. If, um, it's perfect that I'm going to die. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, it's not perfect that you're going to die. No, it's a, uh, it's. I always thought so. This is the part that always intrigued me. Um, that like sales organizations always had a role called sales enablement, right? They didn't call it sales training. They didn't call it, you know, but it was, it was like there was a guy or a gal, or there was a role in, in the sales team that was the sales enablement person. And I can remember when back when I first started my career, looking at the different types of jobs and things like that, seeing to myself, well, why is it that the, the sales trainer has a different name than all the other organizations, like all the other organizations have training departments that all play together nicely. And in, in, you know, the, this little group, this little, uh, little cabal of training professionals, you know, and, uh, but then there's sales and sales has sales enablement and those people play in their own little world. And I always have scratched my head and wondered why. And then over the years kind of figured it out, but I mean, I don't know, maybe you've got a better answer than just, it is what it is. No, it's pretty clear. Like how do you, how do you measure, how do you measure revenue professionals? How are, how are revenue professionals in organizations typically measured? Any guesses? Anybody in the chat? Mm. I could guess. We'll see what the chat, the chat says. Guess. Yeah. Let's see what the chat says. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. It might take a minute for it to update, but. Oh, Heather's in the sales training department and they call it sales training. Wow. Okay. See, maybe we're making some progress and we're, we're bringing them into the fold. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so, and the reason is, no, I hope not. So, so, okay. KPIs. So there's KPIs that are, that are out there. What's the biggest number? What's the thing? Okay. So quotas, there's a quota. They've got a quota. They've got something that they've got to do. It's super, super clear. There's no ambiguity. You either hit your number or you did not hit your number. 
no ambiguity. You you know that you're winning or you're losing. You know that you're behind. You know that you're ahead. It's very clear. So when you reduce ambiguity, it be, you can and have a high level of clarity. You can put yourself into a position where you can start to say, okay, well, here are the things that will actually help us move closer to getting to that number. And then when you implement those things, you can actually test and assess whether or not they moved you closer to the number. And if they didn't move you closer to the number, you stop. And if they move, you did, if they, or excuse me, if they move you closer to the number, you keep going. If they don't move you closer to the number, you stop, right? So there's this feedback loop that you constantly have. And we talk about it in learning about the importance of feedback loops and iterations and you know, adult learning theory and all of this other kinds of stuff. In revenue roles, there's no theory. You have to perform. You either get there or you don't. So how do we figure out, how do we come up with a way to actually make, create instances where the revenue team can perform better? Those people who are engaged with our customers, because if our customers are not performing, our business won't perform. If our customers aren't performing, they're not going to pay us. If our customers are not performing, they're not going to recommend us. If we don't have this cash flow coming into the business, we can't afford to keep many of the people that are on this call in training roles, employed, doing things like leadership and culture and effective communication and some of these squishier, softier, softer things that when you go back and you say, well, did it work? Well, what are, what are we basing that on? Are we, you know, where are we going in Kirkpatrick's model as we go through this stuff? Like, so that's, that's what I think is the, is the big difference. It's, it, it, it works because if it doesn't work, we're no longer, we no longer have jobs. Mm -hmm. And we push this all the time, right? Well, let me just stop for a second and just ask Chris, when you see the term organization enablement, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I think enablement is a broader term than than training, right? Um, it isn't just about creating something that people go through as an experience and then they come up on the other side with knowledge or skills. There's other pieces of it, right? There's there's help in the time of need. There are resources and tools and, um, you know, other other pieces of an equation. So enablement is certainly a much broader term than than training, at least to me. That's kind of the part that I've liked about it the most is that as we as a as a as an L and D world, right? We talk about hey, we, we these days we develop more than just courses, right? We do develop you know job aids, we develop micro learning, we develop you know knowledge bases, we develop you know all of these this what we just typically generally call learning content that helps enable people so it always just when mike and i have talked about it it makes a lot more sense to think about it as we're enabling the whole entire organization to perform better and, and what's cool about it when you take that perspective i think and in my experience when you take that perspective you start to look at things differently you say okay well is this a training problem is it a coaching problem is it a process problem is it a culture problem where like in from an opportunity perspective, and there's this really cool model that comes out of the UK. It's called COMB uh, around behavior change, uh, C-O-M-B. And the C stands for capability. Capability is knowledge and skill. O stands for opportunity. Oppor do they have the right opportunity? People have the right opportunity to be successful. This starts to get into some of the culture and leadership challenge it's the inside organizations. M stands for motivation. Are they actually motivated to do the thing. If you miss on any of those three, behavior change is really hard. So when we think of, we start to shift our thinking and say, hey, this is less about developing training aligned to a specific set of learning objectives and desired outcomes. We start to get into, we start to think a little bit differently about holistically, how do we deliver this? How is it supported ongoing? How are we going to test and assess whether or not it's working? What changes are we going to be prepared to make? And who better to do that than people who are really, really, really excited about design and excited about helping people do things better? And, not, and imagine if you're one of those people who struggles getting budget, and now you can actually tie all of the other things into the story that you're delivering inside your organization. And now we're enabling the organization. We're not just sending people out to training. I think 
I think there's an opportunity for a bit of a mindset shift, a movement shift, and a transition, which starts to increase the perceived value of the people who, like everybody who's on here, are doing to help enable the organization to be successful. And I'm going to throw that into the chat. It's actually, it's COM-B, and it is out of uh, Joe's part of the world. It's uh, it's out of some research that came together uh, out of uh, out of the UK. Hmm. It, it, the thing that strikes me when I hear you talking about this, and you've presented about this, and you have presentations to talk to different events about it and whatnot, but it's um, it, it's it, you're not nothing's changing. It's um, it feels, it just feels to me like an easier way to talk about what we're all talking about anyways, but it, I think like you mentioned a, a mind shift, right? It takes us out of constantly thinking about the Addy model or constantly thinking about what we've historically always thought about. Like we're all, we're all always talking about we need to go to the fifth level of Kirkpatrick or we need to measure more. Or we need to do that. But then we still fall back to how do we get there with the Addy model or how do we get there with our current models and all of that kind of stuff instead of just sort of changing the conversation and changing the terms because none of our work is actually going to change. Like let's say we were able to magically tell people we're not L and D anymore. We're org enablement we'd still be all doing the same stuff, right? Like, like I, I don't, I don't see any like real difference. I mean, I mean, you know, there should be, but this would be an interesting way for us to get to that change. I don't know. Somebody smarter than me has talked about this um, uh, in the context of branding. And there's a number of stories. I'm sure there's somebody on, on the, in the chat who will remember a branding story and say like the difference between X and Y is branding. And it might be the difference between, um, I, you know, I, I'm going to have to think through this and, and <laughs> so that we can connect the dots here, but there are some people who do really, really crap work yet. Everybody points to them as being this, the thought leader and subject matter expert relative to this thing. They're very good at marketing and branding. They may not be good at executing. They're very good at marketing and branding. Like we'll hear the stories in the background. So you know, when we think about the types of impact, the type of impact that we want to make inside the organizations we're working with, maybe there's something to branding yourself a bit differently. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's really just a mindset shift where you start to say, when I'm thinking about how I'm helping, how I'm assisting, how I'm enabling the organization, am I considering the challenge in the context of people? Am I considering the challenge in, this, in the context of technology? Am I considering the challenge in the context of process? Three different ways to look at the challenge. Too many times, I'm a trainer, so I'm going to go and train the absolute crap out of you and it's going to help and, <laughs> and, I, and the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> if you're a technology person, you're thinking I can just throw SAS at this and we're going to solve everything. And all we need is LXP because that LXP is going to change the world in the way that people interact with, with the LMS and then interact with the content behind it and all of that other kind of stuff. Or is it a process thing? Is it uh, really understanding what the workflow looks like from an individual perspective? It says we go through this stuff just being able to step back, pause, look at something through another lens can significantly shift the impact that you're having on the other side. And, the, and to get back to the point that was brought up earlier about the financial numbers, if you understand how your the, the people you serve, whether it's internal or external, if you understand how they're measured, how they are, report on success, you can align with those measurements and deliver some things that actually have business impact on them, not feel good because we checked the box because we developed our people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, what you're describing aligns with um, a lot of conversations that we've had um, here on, on Idiotic, constantly looking to be beyond order takers, for instance, um, being told that we need a course. 
do we need a course, right? So being able to to have a, an avenue for that conversation to open that up, even by saying, well, what what are the results that you're looking to affect, and what are the you know the best ways to affect that? Maybe spending all of the time and money on a course isn't the thing, for instance. So that you know it's a it's a great structure for that challenge that we seem to always end up circling back to here on idiotic. Um, it also reminds me of, uh, uh, and we've mentioned this a few different times, but Kathy Moore's um, presentation on an e-learning action hero of starting with the organizational goals and then, you know, how the role needs to affect that and then finding out what you need to enable that person or uh, you know, empower them to do, um, which is a great model from, you know, that she put together for also helping us avoid the content dumping approach that we often end up doing in instructional design of putting all the stuff that everybody might ever need to know. No, here are the tasks you need to do. Uh, in order to affect your your results, and here's the information you need in order to do those tasks. But a very um, a very great model that uh, you know helps reduce a lot of the uh, you know the, the the noise that often ends up as part of a training program too. So lots of overlap, and there's been a few different chats. Uh, you know, Kim was asking, you know, how is this different from organizational development? And you know, some similar names and that sort of a thing. I think what we're trying to what we're talking about really is is something that's not just the word you know the training piece of it that it's 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 that sense of the bigger package eh? but let's dive into that because i think it's a i think it's an important point um sean also asks um you know how's it different from human performance technology right it sounds very familiar mm -hmm. and so when you when people ask you that what what do you how do you typically respond so you got od you got hpt what is the problem we're trying to solve for that's it like <laughs> what's let's let's just get back to our roots i here, quite frankly i don't care what anybody calls any of this stuff right it, it just it's a, it's another word associated with it so you know e-learning e uh e-commerce we put ease on top in front of things we put micro things in front of things we've come up with all all these names and labels the, the benefit of having a name and a label like this is when you put it out there, then you can define around it. And then as an organization, you can come together and say, okay, this is how we define what enablement is. And this is how we define what um, the organization is looking to achieve. And this is how we define X, Y, and Z. So there's not a lot of uh, ambiguity, you create clarity inside the organization. So I, quite frankly, I don't care what anybody calls these things. What I care about is that there's this problem that continues to persist inside organizations where we continue to build things that ultimately don't get used or don't have the impact that we want them to have. We create waste inside the organization. And that doesn't make anybody feel good. Like I can't imagine that somebody woke up in the morning and was like, I am going to spend the next six months building this new immersive uh, XR environment so that now everybody can not only collaborate, but they can do real-time coaching and all of these other cool things. And then we launch it and nobody uses it because mm -hmm. the tech doesn't work or the, well, the, the glasses hurt their heads or Oh, we designed for um, MetaQuest Pro, and now Apple has brought out this amazing new set of glasses that is going to completely change the world. And I don't need to hold onto things in my hands like that. So it's not it's not as much about it's not as much about the label. It's about the job to be done. And there are a lot of people who talk about jobs to be done. So I so the, so the way that I the way that I address that whenever talking about it is what's the specific problem we're looking to solve. Why is that important to solve? Who has the problem? Who's impacted by the problem? Who cares about the people who have or are impacted by the problem? And if you've seen my hexagon model, it's this is the top side of the Mary Poppins approach to problem solving. There's this view of looking at things and saying, all right, let's get clarity around the specific problem that we're trying to solve, who's impacted by it, who has it, who cares about those why it persists, why it's important to solve business impact. And then we can start moving forward with designing solutions that actually solve for the problem, not get caught up in the discussion of we, I need a seat at the table or, uh, you know, whatever other thing has been going on for 20 years. Like the, the technology has shifted, but the problem relative to L and D hasn't changed much. I mean, people are still talking about seat at the table. Yeah. How many people on this, on this call have taken the time to build their business acumen? Oh, there's a good one. We might have to wait a while to get responses on, on that one. 
<laughs> so I ask a lot of questions. That's how that's how I respond to that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Kim has noted um, when my team works in the OD space, we recommend performance interventions that may include changing processes, changing procedures, putting the right people in the right seats, changing technologies. So, you know, and as she's noted, it sounds like there's a good synergy um, uh, with the uh, with with your your OE and 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 what she does in OD. There's yeah, it's a, I like I think it's it is the um I think sadly it all boils down to perception at the end of the day and I hate to oversimplify it too much but it's like whose job is it seems to be the question that always comes up. It's like um you know, we know in the training world if I mean typically if we all had it our way, right? It if it's not a skills gap and it's not a knowledge gap, we're out. Somebody else has to deal with that. Not our problem is typically how I hear, uh, how should I say, hey, academically strong instructional design folks, mm -hmm. right? Because the only thing we can solve as training professionals is a skills gap or a knowledge gap. That's yeah. it. That's all. That's all we can do. And I like to feel like there's more that we can do. <laughs> so something, something that's in what Kim, what I just read from Kim and and, and Mike, you've mentioned this too, is and, and which I think a lot of us who are in what we call L and D or training or whatever don't often, you know, have an ability to, uh, you know, uh, changing processes and changing procedures. Right? We we we're not in in a position usually to to say you guys should just do something you know differently as opposed to um here's more information or or whatever to support you know what you're currently doing so that's a different um that's a different piece too isn't just looking at the um you know looking at things we probably don't normally feel we're allowed you know to be involved in yeah yeah like if it's a, like if it's a coaching thing you mentioned no. coaching why not why aren't we allowed yeah yeah well, it's because we often have these silos, right? Uh, and 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 other people's assumptions of what we do as a training department. So you're not even invited to participate in in thinking about how a process could change or so. Yeah, and I I think uh, Sabia has a great point uh, to you know what is the what is the pain point? What do they need to do differently? It's so simple. And it, yes, seemingly so simple, I think would be a, a good word to add in there because any of you that have worked in a corporate space have probably bumped into that wall where it actually isn't that simple. You've either got somebody saying, I don't care what you think, my people need management training or my, you know, one person screwed up, therefore everybody in the organization must be trained and it must be training. And when you do the proper analysis, which you can do maybe a fishbone diagram, you know, whatever, and you figure out what the real problem is. And maybe the real problem was this one person screwed up because the process is bad. And and nobody's actually following the process or something like that, right? But you've got a manager or a leader somewhere saying, I don't care. It, it, I believe it's a training problem. Therefore, training department, get the training delivered and done. Period. Yeah. So, so how many how many of us have delivered training around difficult conversations? Or you know, radical candor inside the organization, or more effective communication from a leadership perspective, which happens to be part of the management training that you might be building. Yet we struggle with having that conversation with the person, the leader inside the organization who's pushing back. So are are we not eating our own dog food? Are we not going back through the training and applying the training in those instances to really push back? And I, so, don't get me wrong. Change is really, 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 really freaking hard. You know, you've got, yeah. you're dealing with human beings. Human beings have different perspectives. They have different objectives. They have different desired outcomes. They have different you know, insecurities that are going on inside their head. So there's a right place and a wrong place to, to have that kind of conversation. Like in that instance, if the leader is really pushing and saying this is a management training management, uh, we need training, we got to train our people, then um, I would not in a public forum question that person. <laughs> That's nope. Yeah. So I, if we laugh, yet we 
sometimes mm-hmm. we get defensive and we get irritated. And you know, when we, when people talk like as trainers, as people who are really passionate about the work we do, we want to speak louder and more slowly so that people understand on the other end, how well does that work mm-hmm. when you're speaking English in Mexico city? Like, let's go, let's go through and actually have some of those difficult conversations with people, pull them aside and ask the really specific questions, like do some root cause analysis here, ask why a couple of times channel that inner two-year-old put your lowest lane reporter hat on and start really drawing pieces of information out. And these things are hard. I, I, I get it. It, this is not, it's not simple stuff. If it was simple, we wouldn't have all of these problems and we wouldn't need to keep training people. Right. Yep. 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 Oh, they're going to continue to persist. I think the question we need to ask is, is there a better way? Um, yeah. Is there, can, how do we get more people engaged? How do we make it more approachable? Like when people say human resources, is HR someone you go to because they're a value added resource segment <laughs> inside the organization, or is it where you go when you're in trouble? You know, like what's the perception that's out there? And some of these things, so, you know, some, sometimes we might have, I'm going to figure out where that story comes from around the branding piece, but you know, some people, sometimes we've got a branding issue in the way that we work through it. Um, if you're not, my challenge is if you're not accomplishing the things you want to accomplish, you feel like you're running into a much more pressure than is necessary. Maybe if you start shifting the questions they ask inside the organization, you might uh, identify that a way to get to better results or determine maybe you're in the wrong organization. Yeah, let's go into that. Let's talk about those questions or what your or uh, or your model that you like to go through and yeah. and walk people through to figure that stuff out. Right. And uh, and and just before we shift into that mode, though, I do just want to recognize uh, Michelle putting it very clearly uh, and actually giving us a great example of what I started off our conversation with. She says, I have been in sales enablement roles and normally do not report to the L&D or HR teams. We partner with them when needed, but otherwise we do our own things, but keep our HR partner in the loop. It seems uh, yes. So, so for those of you who maybe thought Brent was crazy, that there really is this great connection. It's thank you, Michelle, for for uh, <laughs> clarifying and confirming <laughs> that there are two worlds. <laughs> All right, I'm going to focus you, Mike. If you're going to the whiteboard, I just noticed you spin around there, but maybe set us up here for what we're going to talk about. Okay. So let's, let's figure, let's, what is, what is a, what is a, what's an ongoing problem that we run into from a, from a instructional design perspective that continues to persist? Just you know, either, either give me a common problem that we've not figured out how to solve yet, or a common problem that's actually pretty simple to solve, but for whatever reason, it continues to come up. Just give me a problem. Like a, like a problem that we have with management, like that standard, we want a seat at the table or like a legit, like perfect uh, or a detail problem. Want to see, want to seat at the table. All right. Okay. I'm going to okay. focus you. Hold on a second. So, Six so we've got seat at the table at the top, at the top. Is, is that really, is that really the problem? Like, so let's go a little bit deeper is, you know, is is seat at the table the core part of the problem? Like we just need to be in the room. Is there something else behind it? Like let's get let's get really clear around the definition of what the seat at the table problem is. So how would you describe that? And anybody add in the chat? I'm watching the chat. I'm a little slow on responding. Um, but I you know, anybody who has other things they want to contribute here. What's the seat at the table problem? Let's define the seat at the table problem. Go ahead. I'm I'm following the chat for you, so don't sweat that. Okay. Um, but um, I, yeah. I think one very one way that I would uh, characterize that you know the issue of seat at the table is is that sense that we're being just looked at as order takers, right? Okay. We we need you know we're being asked to create something, but by not being part of um you know the discussions or at the table earlier. We're not able to participate in suggesting other things than, say, creating a training program. And Tanya says our expertise is ignored and not respected. Yep. And Kim says, uh, don't know that we need a seat at the table. Ah, now the truth comes out. <laughs> awesome. Nice work, Kim. Yeah. Uh, 
Tanya okay. says decisions are made that we actually have knowledge about and could have educated the group to take them into consideration. Yeah, but they, but then, but then they didn't get that information because they didn't include us. Uh, okay, just to tack that on. I, I said that, not yeah. I just, I added that piece on there. So, for the purpose of this exercise, let's agree that seat at the table is the primary problem that we're looking to solve, and we've got a little some some information that kind of indicates what the um um how that problem is defined and and really what we're doing is we're saying ultimately if if we solve for this we actually get someone who's in the room who's part of conversations can at least have access to what's happening from a strategic perspective inside the organization when decisions are being made they can ask some questions so we need we need a seat at the table all right so let's this is part of the hexagon. Let's talk about who has the problem. So who are the people that have this problem? The seat at the table problem. Uh, the training people or the training department or training managers, um, or if it's a one man team, I guess, totally depends on the org. Yep. So, and, you know, in this instance, one of the, one of the tough problems is it's us as we go through it. So if we are the ones who have the problem, it's hard to look <laughs> Hard to, hard to get outside of our own our own shell, but we've so we've identified training man, training department, training managers, learning leaders. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Yeah. <laughs> this gets into what is, what's the whole yeah you know, the difference between like the 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 pig and the and the chicken and their impact on breakfast. You know, one of them is you know one of them is just part of it. And, the, and you see, I, I've got to work on my stories a little bit better. This is <laughs> how to get better. One of these days I will come I, I will come more prepared with better stories like this. If it's hockey, football, revenue, goals, I could work on that. If it's chickens, brown chicken and egg, we're 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 in, we're in trouble. Uh, so uh, who cares about the people in that in those roles? Who cares about the people? That are in the <laughs> department, the training manager. I was going to say nobody, and maybe that's <laughs> under, under the one of the problems. <laughs> so nobody, somebody cares. Somebody cares. That oh, like yeah. does the CEO right, of right. the company care about the things that are important to people in training and development roles? Like, does, does the CEO of the company care about um, how the organization is going to perform? Does the CEO of the company care about? um impact that they're having in the marketplace so the caring is a tough word i would say they care about the people that we are training more so than us but i think they understand that they that we that the training department does help enable all of the people that they really do care about that are actually out there doing the work that produces the revenue Perfect. So we've got another bl a block that I missed as we we're going through this. It's who's impacted by the fact that we're that we don't have a seat at the table. And it's the, and it, just to move things along, it's the people we serve, right? So the so employees inside the organization, um, customers. So if training doesn't have a seat at the table, our customers are impacted, our employees are impacted, the people who care about training and the, our customers and our employees is the CEO. Now we've got different perspectives that we can look at the problem through all doing okay so far, other than my, yep. uh, my chicken, picking chig, chicken and pig joke. Uh, so on the other side of this, the other side of the hexagon, it's why, why does it persist? Why is the problem continue to persist? Why do we not have access? Why are we not at the table? Chris, what do you think? <laughs> uh, tradition. <laughs> it, it, and from that, I mean, you know, the, the, the perspective that people have on L&D, that's one of the pieces, right? People say, oh, we need a training department. And we know what training does. They make courses and they put people through them. So there's that, uh, you know, traditional view of the role that we have. That's one of the things. Joe has a good one. She says, we haven't proved ourselves. Cool. So we've got... That's awesome. We haven't proved ourselves. We there's assumptions and there's tradition. And I'm I'm just I'm moving through this quick because I'm, I'm I'm taking a look at at time. There's one yeah. more question on the top side of this diagram. Um, 
Oh, and Dana, yeah. Dana also says training solutions are prescribed. So there's this perception of here's yeah, it's a it's a uh, we already everybody knows what training is, and so just do that. Yeah. So there, so there's a like there's this so there it, there's a, a perception of value associated with that. So like if yeah. we don't we don't really need them because they're because. All we're going to do is give a bunch of pieces out to people. And once the requirements are done, someone's going to be able to design around the requirements and then they'll be able to design something. And before you know it, someone comes back with one of these things. And what I really needed was one of these things, but they're actually are both writing utensils that write in black and um, allow me to convey thoughts on some kind of medium. And the reality is this one is not going to work very well on my whiteboard. This one will work better. So we design, we, des we, we design the solution without all of the context. Mm -hmm. So on the impact side, this is where we start to get into the different perspectives, both from an employee and customer standpoint, a self standpoint and the CEO, what's the actual business impact of solving this problem, having, how will this change what we're doing in an organization? How will it help drive things that are most important? Those things that are in our annual reports, those things that we say on our website about whatever it is that we say on our website about how we innovate and how we do all of those things. So we've got, why does it persist? Why does the problem continue to sit out there? And why is it important to solve? What's the actual business impact that we're going to have? So what at the top, who over here, and why? And that's why I call it my Mary Poppins approach to problem solving. And I feel like uh, you know, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all, and I'm Yondu cruising out in volume two of Guardians of the Galaxy. But what mm -hmm. ends up happening with most of us is we go from what to how yeah. without the context. And then we get into situations where I get into fights with my wife, Jen, and I will argue because I'm already jumping into here's how we're going to solve for stuff. And I don't have all the other pieces. So my challenge to everybody here is when you go through and you start thinking about problem solving, apply the Mary Poppins approach, and we can add in the other parts of the hexagon. So how, when, what's my 30, 60, 90, when, short-term, medium-term, short-term, medium-term, long-term, what's my project plan? And when I look at this on a sheet, I can start to say, you know what? I don't have the perspective of all of these people. I don't really understand the impact. I haven't interviewed people to get the impact. If I'm missing on any of these things, these lines are not solid. That shape can't hold water. I have risk relative to the thing that I'm doing. Yet for whatever reason, we always jump from what to how, because we are pretty, pretty phenomenal when it comes to delivering a training solution inside an organization. And I've got like all of this amazing training. I will train the crap out of you and help you <laughs> solve whatever you're working on. If you go through these questions, you will get yourself into a position where you're like, huh, I've avoided risk because I've helped uncover a couple of blind spots and I have brought people along in it because I'm not in my own element. I'm only one third of this group. I have it. Yep. Who cares about it? Who's impacted by it? So that is uh, problem solving simplified. And what I would suggest is that we as enablement professionals, we as people who want to enable others to do their jobs really, really well, if we get really good at problem solving like this, have frameworks that help us avoid, reduce blind spots, gain additional perspective, we will deliver better solutions inside the organization and we will be able to better demonstrate value to the people who are getting in the way and allow the problem to continue to persist. So there you go, mm. Mary Poppins. There we go. Everybody get your Google on for Mary Poppins problem solving. <laughs> I think this helps us tell the story, mm -hmm. right? It helps, it's, a, it's an excellent process to build the story with which you're going to talk to people about that original problem. Because when they ask, if you've gone through this whole process, all the questions that they're gonna ask you, you're gonna have answers to because you've already gone through this process of figuring it out. I appreciate you going through the Mary Poppins approach. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's a fabulous framework. Uh, I've been making notes. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, and if you go to findmycatalyst.com, I know I put the link in there. You can see 
this is where you can access a lot of these tools. This is this is one cool. of one of a couple of tools that I've got out yep. there. Um, so uh, thanks for having me today, guys. This has been I oh, our pleasure, Mike. Our pleasure. Uh, lots of value being added. Lots of great stuff in the chat, etc. Yeah. Yes, and um, we've gone a little bit long today already, but yeah, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, as part of wrapping up, folks, folks who know us uh, and know what we do, you know that we uh, we reach the end of July and we typically take the month of August off, uh, then come back hard at it again in September. Great conversations, holiday time over August. This year's a little bit different because um, this is actually going to be our last official instructional designers in offices drinking coffee hashtag idiotic episode. Um, we're putting together something new and different for the fall, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, but, uh, Mike, you were one of our very earliest guests way, way back five years ago, five plus years ago, 240 some ish, uh, episodes overall quarter of a million downloads of the audio podcast. That's, that's kind of a stunning number overall. Right. So, but, uh, it's time for us to, to shift gears, do something different. So make sure you stay tuned for what we're, what we'll be working on towards in September gang. We've really, really, really been honored by having everybody here join us in, joining us every week. Um, we've had a blast. Brent and I get a lot of fun out of this, don't we, Brent? It's been the best, best Wednesday mornings. Always a good reason to wake up. I have loved awesome. doing this for you all. I hope everybody has gotten something out of it. You've got all the recordings you can go back to so you can continue to relive it forever. Yeah, yeah. Resources for, for your future. <laughs> Gang, thanks, everybody. As always, we'll mention <clears throat> what we get to do here on Structural Designers and Offices. Drinking coffee is brought to you by Domino. There's a big green button at the bottom there. We can help you solve a lot of problems around organizational enablement. Not just training, he said, knowingly. Get that link. Check us out. Reach out to us. We can tell you more. Have a great time, guys. Thank you so much for all your chats. Thanks, everybody, so much. The chat room has always been my favorite part of Idiotic, and you guys are the greatest. This community rocks, and uh, we will we will see you in new communities for sure. Mm -hmm. Mike, thanks again, man. You're the best. Thank you. Adios, everybody.